Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So session four, this is, and uh, now we're moving in a slightly different direction. And uh, of course, when you consider racing, what is racing without the person sitting on top of the horse? You get the elite level, and you've also got the amateur level. And we're also going to look at other people who are working within racing, looking at uh, a sports medicine perspective of the elite jockey's life, but also then at every other level and vocational training for people who want to work with horses. So, uh, Professor, if I could invite you up to the stage, Professor Patrick Shu Hang Yong is director out of all these four titles that he holds, also director at the Hong Kong Center for Sports Medicine and Sports Sciences. Professor, you're going to talk to us about the modern elite jockey, good jockey and give us yeah. that sports medicine perspective. So, over to you. Thank you very much um, for a very kind introduction. Kamsamida, right? So, first of all, I would like to thank the Hong Kong Jockey Club and the Asian uh, Racing Conference uh, to invite me to come over here to share with you about my little experience in um, taking care of the jockeys as, as well as uh, the application of the sports medicine and science knowledge uh, in um, this uh, uh, sports, I would say that, right? So, I'm coming from the, um, uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong which I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so means taking care of the bone and joints, muscle, tendons, all these stuff, right? So, and my subspecialty is sports medicine um, since 25 years back, right? So, um, that's why I work in this uh, university hospital, as well as um, working in the Hong Kong Sports Institute as an honorary consultant, taking care of the Hong Kong team the, regarding those elite sports, right? And, well, my hospital is very near to the Sha Tin Race Course in Hong Kong. So that's why I have the obligations and the honor to take care of the injured uh, jockeys over the years. Um, well, personally, I'm not, you know, riding horse, but I, I play a lot of soccer, but I suffer from a lot of different sports injuries, and that's my operated knee back in 27 years back to until creation the games of the knee joint, right? But uh, because of that, right, I, I have experienced a lot about the the sufferings of the elite sportsmen, including those jockeys when they are like um, out of competitions, out of trainings and all this, right? So I really want to help them so, with my uh, expertise. Personally, I'm also a horse owner, right? So that's also you know, increase a little bit of my touch on horse racing, right? Well, in the coming life 30 minutes, I'm going to bring you through a little bit about the followings. First of all, I will talk about the jockey's injuries. The epidemiology means the incidents and what the patterns of in injuries that we discovered in Hong Kong and also around the world from literature. And then secondly, I will talk about the preventive measures and how to apply those sports medicine and science knowledge in, in uh, uh, horse racing to improve the performance. Right? And thirdly, I will touch on a little bit about the other applications of sports medicines in this field. And finally, I would like to conclude and discuss with all of you, Ray. Sorry. Just take a bit of that. Ah, oh, yeah. So you can see that, oh, it's playing here, not playing here, right? Um, yeah, hopefully the rest of the videos will be playing. It's playing here in the theory, right? Who well, suppose that the, all these videos are playing, right? <laughs> because I have like dozens of videos in this PowerPoint. Hopefully that will play. In the, in the screen. It's playing in the TV here. Right? But um, those are about the jockeys falling um, out um, uh, and got different kinds of injuries, right? Uh, hopefully we can fix that because, uh, because uh, that's... Okay, anyway, yeah. So, um, well, the horse racing is a very well attended sport, so I would say, that in Hong Kong and all over the world. And nowadays, it's high professionalism. It involves high energy and fast-paced sports. So I regard it as a kind of sports, a, a very high demanding sports. However, the current knowledge and scientific research pertaining to jockey's injuries are still very lacking, right? say. So, so as I mentioned, I'll first bring you through about the jockey injuries right now. This is a very old paper, 20-something years back by, uh, from the uh, United States, right? is uh, one of the first paper talking about the different kinds of injuries that suffers by the jockeys right, in horse racing. So you can see that right, quite a lot of them suffer from injuries from like around the, uh, the, the head and neck regions, uh, the knee regions, the ankle regions, the spine and the upper limbs. Right? So 20 years later, 
This is the paper published in 2018, this year, from Australia, right? A very similar patterns have been observed. Let me say over the past 20 years, the pattern is more or less the same, right? The predominant injured area is still around the ankle joint, the shoulders, the back, and the wrist and hand, right? And of course, adding on is those concussion and head injuries, right? Well, the most common injury mechanisms definitely is fell from horse, right? So um, how, how common is it, right? You can see that, well, from this, all these figures, it's those figures from the American California with like a five years of studies, showing that like for, every, for each jockey, they probably will fall once in every 500 race. Okay, they will fall once in every 500 races, right? In average, 50% of this fall will result in significant injury which required medical attention. So it's quite significant, I would say that, right? And if you talk about the whole track, the most common injuries taking place is around the gate. Before they enter the gate, inside the gate, and just started. And the second common is near the finishing nice at the final home stretch, right? Oh, now, this is a kind of one of the injuries that I um, saw from one of my patients, a jockey. Hopefully, Amy will not feel very painful because a lot of them are her students, right? So, um, he's still an apprentice, right? So, he suffered from different kinds of injuries from this fall a hip dislocation, a fracture of the foot, a fracture of the spine. That was like two months back only, right? So uh, for this kind of injuries, luckily he did not re require uh, inter uh, surgical interventions, but he needs to be signed for about three to four months. Okay. Another video sh showing now this another injuries, right? Well, he is. This is also a practice like about uh, one and a half years back, right? He suffered from this injury and it resulted in an ankle fracture dislocations, right? And that was fixed with all the screws and plates. And he need to be signed for like about three to four months, right? So another case. Okay. So you, you can see that real often is the horse, the problem started from the horse rather than the jockey itself, right? So in this case, this uh, apprentice suffered from um, a, a lumbar spine fracture from the first level of the lumbar, uh, lumbar spine to the fourth level. So four level lumbar spine fractures, right? And he was signed for about two and a half to three months, right? So another injuries, right? So he, he suffered from a four arm fractures, right? You can see that the bone is broken, right? Over here. So um, then we fix it, right, with a plate and screws, right? Well, those are the injuries that were commonly found affecting the limbs and the spine. You can see that. But you can see that for these cases, this is like a chain of horse falling down because one horse fell down and then the others fell down. And then that resulted in a, a, a series of injuries. And in one of these, resulted in head injuries, which what we call concussions, right? There's no breathing inside the, uh, the, the head or this, but he was like a bit confused, dizzy and all this, and then he need to be signed out for about three weeks, right? Well, this is concussions. So indeed concussions, doesn't it, to a lot of people, it seems to be like something not very serious, like a hit on the head, but there's no breathing inside the head, and then probably you can go, go back to train like five or four days later, right? But essentially not, right? If we follow strictly about the sports medicine guidelines for the other sports like rugby and soccer, right? Concussion can be a very serious consequence if you do not treat him well or monitor him or her very well, right? So indeed, concussion is not uncommon. From these papers from UK, showing that about 50%, sorry, uh, about 40% of those jockeys in their career experience kind of concussions, okay? It's not just a simple bomb on the head. After that, they feel dizzy, a bit, you know, uh, nausea, and sometimes they lost a little bit of memory, tempor memory temporary for a short while and all this, right? And then 19% of these concussed jockeys didn't seek any medical advice, and then they go back to, to, to train and then to, 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 to race the horse, right? And then over 50% of those concussed less, took less than five days and go back to train by themselves. And this, this is very dangerous. Nowadays, if you are diagnosed to be concussion, to have uh, concussions in the sports medicine arena around the world, in rugby, football, and other sports, you need to be assigned for at least 
seven days, and then you need to be reassessed whether you're fit or not. So this is a very good guy now, what nowadays for all around the world, different kinds of sport, what we call a SCAT, right? The sports concussion, you know, assessment tools, right? Now it's the fifth version already. Uh, I think that nowadays we should try to engage these assessments in our jockeys, right? Indeed, as I mentioned, it is not an uncommon injuries among the jockeys, right? Well, this and other papers analyzing the injuries to, for those um, uh, 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 professional jockeys, and I want to take this to look, talk about the, the time they need to be cyanided. That means that they cannot train, they cannot race for how long after different kinds of injury. Looking at this, right? So for concussions, they need to be rested somehow because of the delay on the treatment and recognitions. They need to be rested for like 43 days and for about for some serious injuries, like fracture and all this, they need to be cyanided for two or three months, etc. So it's a lot of time, it's a lot of money, a lot of resources to get them back, right? Well, um, this is even a little bit more serious. These are also UK studies and also including some studies from the United States talking about mortality, death. So for example, in Americans, every year, they are having like about one to four cases of fatality, means death after falling from horse. But looking at this, horse racing is not that dangerous because if you compare with the other sports, rugby, soccer, and all this, it's slightly harder than rugby and soccer, but much, much more safer than the other kinds of sports, like air sports, water sports, etc., as shown in this studies from the England and Wales uh, group, right? So you can see that ho uh, horse racing is like about for every hundred million cases, hundred millions of uh, uh, day practice, there's only about 37 cases, 34 cases of mortality. So I just want to take this as a summary of what I've gone through over the past 10 minutes, right? So in summary, first of all, the most commonest cause of injury is fall from horse. It is important. That means that if we can minimize the chance of falling from horse, then probably we can minimize the injury. But how can we minimize the chance of falling from horse? It's probably we need to take care about the horse or the track, right? So secondly is uh, the commonest regions, including those like head regions, the upper limbs and the spine and the ankle joints. And the injury patterns most commonly is the fracture followed by the head injuries with concussions. So, and all, moreover, I want to summarize a little bit from all those papers I've read and uh, those from literatures. So, jockeys falls at about one every 500 rides. Okay? And second is 50% of the falls resulted in injury that need medical attention. Majority of the falls happened during the race. And most common reason for causing a fall is because of the sudden death or catastrophic event of the horse during the race. And most common injuries are the fractures around the upper limbs, 50%, and then 20% around the ankle joint, and then 10% around your spine, as well as the head injuries. Every jockey in average sustained 2.5 fractures in their career. Okay, someone got none, but someone got more, right? And about 40% of the jockeys experience concussions during their career. And finally, mortality rate means death during horse racing is not that high. It's roughly one in 300,000 days of exposures for a jockey. Right? So this is all the figures probably for all of you here. For the first like 10 minutes, you would like to have a bit of summaries and, and, and for some of the you know, administrators and, uh, and, and, um, and we like to take this as a reference for the future's uh, um, uh, plannings for the welfare of the jockeys. Right? So I would like to go to the second part of my presentation, which is about the preventions and how sports medicine can help to have a better performance of the jockeys. Right? So we do not want to take this happen again, right? As I mentioned, so it's one, two, three, four, four horses falling down, right? So there are lots of measures to minimize injuries sustained by the horse. Interestingly, if you go to literatures and different organizations, they have different measures to try to cater for the horse, but need to for the jockeys, right? So the risk factors, which is known on study for the horses, including the tracks, a lot of the studies try to investigate how to improve the track to minimize the injuries, the falling of the horse, and then the wearer, and also the starting gaze. I think this is quite reasonable, if, as I mentioned before. If the horse falls, then the jockey will fall, and then the jockey will get injured, right? 
So, and that's why I think that there are some possible risk factors for the jockeys themselves, which may cause them to fall, irrespective of whether the horse will fall or not. For example, the strength, the flexibility of the jockey, the endurance and power, the balance, the reaction time, and also the protective gear, as well as the number of races within a certain period. So those are have been investigated slightly in, in some or a few papers research. Uh, if you go back to check the variety in the in, um, uh, literature, right, academic field. Right? So as I mentioned, a horse injured will fall and hockey and a jockey will fall and get injured. So this is very important to go hand in hand to minimize the fall of the jockey as well as the horses. Right? Now, as I mentioned, there are little things to talk about, little literature, little studies to talk about or investigate on how to prevent the force of the jockey. Most of the investigations are performed to try to minimize the fall of the horse, right? But those are some of the papers that I can find out. For example, this is a UK paper, sorry, Australian paper, talking about that, well, they may like to implement a very, a very compulsory rigid vest that around the trunk so much so that they can minimize the injuries to the spine when the jockey fell. Of course, helmets is definitely a compulsory. And this and other papers um, uh, uh, in the Americans try to use the administrative rule to try to minimize the injuries to the jockeys. Essentially, they designed a so-called decision tree model for the implementation of safety strategies in the horse racing industry. What does that mean? They means that they have different rules to try to restrict their apprentice jockeys from riding less accomplished horses, so as to minimize the risk of falling. Well, to prevent jockey from falling, as a medical doctor, I think they must be good at all this. The muscle strength and endurance, flexibility, balance, reaction time, body composition, or even aerobic capacity. So in sports medicine, in football, basketball, rugby, we have all this test factory to test all this stamina that is essential for an elite average. Just like, for example, for this, like um, people are testing the muscle strength, the hamstrings, and all this balance, agility. Well, well those are very widely used nowadays for different kinds of team sports, especially. But for the essential fitness that I just mentioned, it's not just for prevention of fall. For a lot of trainers or the jockeys, they themselves think that, wow, falling, I, I can handle that, I, I just take care, right? But if you talk to them that if I improve your fitness, all these essential elements, it's not just preventing you from falling, it's improving your performance. Then probably you can persuade them to add more time in training for this basic facet. So this is also important for improving the performance. I just take this as an example, right? Probably 100 years ago, right? Well, I'm not an expert in this, but I know that while well, at that time like in UK and America, a lot of people are still what we call seated riding, right? So they sit on the horse and riding. But then they gradually changed to the Martini grass posture. And they found that what well, is significantly improved for about 5 to 7% of the timing of the race, right? So why? Why this Martini grass posture work? Well, if you look from a sports science point of view, you can easily explain that. Because of this posture, you can easily reduce the vertical or, and the horizontal motion of the jockey with respect to the horse. So the jockey is less fighting with the horse. And with this posture improving also the aerodynamic, that's why you are improving the speed of the whole jockey and horse complex moving forward, right? So that means that if the jockey can, can hold this posture more stably, it is advantageous for the whole horse racing, right? So we, we try to implement this. Indeed, I work with uh, Amy and, and the teams, right? Try to implement all this analysis on our practice, right? Previously, over the past two years, well, we did some motion analysis to try to look at the jockeys' vertical and horizontal displacements, as well as looking at what are the muscles they are doing to try over the whole cross, a whole race, to see what the muscles they are lacking that we have to target to train them and improve the performance and decrease the risk of force, right? So this is like this, right? We can essentially stick all these markers on the body and then ask the jockeys to, to ride on this simulating horse, right? Train horse, and then we capture all the data. What we can capture is this, I'm not going to details, but this is like if you go up and down too much, that means that your body is not stable. This is not good, right? If you like a flat knife, this is very good. This is number one. 
Number two, we look at the different muscles from the shoulder to the leg, all the different muscles, and see from start to the finishing line, what are the muscles at what time are you recruiting? Okay? So those are the results. We, we test two, two jockeys. One is a very junior trainee, and then the other is like a good jockey. So we try to differentiate a good jockey versus a fair jockey. And then this is the result. Again, I'm not going to do to details, but I can let you know that there's a big difference in terms of the motion that they generate as well as the muscle that they recruited at a different time phase during the whole course of racing. Well, this Maria is our champion jockey for like more, more than two years terms, right? So he's very good and, you know, won a lot of races uh, over the years in Hong Kong, right? So I took him to test, do a test on this light racing. I'm going to show you a little bit of the results. Well, this videos will take like one minute, right? So to please bear with me. So this is a video and testing that uh, we look at the, the energy expenditures that this jockey is used during the race. Yeah, I think horse racing is such an intense sport. I'm here looking forward to see how much it uses us. So essentially, we'll put him on this simulating horse and then we we'll stick all the, you know, these markers on his body and also this EMG testing, the muscle testing sensors on the different kinds of muscle and ask him to simulate a one mile race. And during all this, we capture all this data to analyze, first of all, the motion and the posture over this like one and a half minutes uh, trial. And secondly, what are the muscles that he is recruiting, right? So this is how we have been doing, right? So uh, because of time, I try to shorten it a little bit, right? Two, one, go! Well, we man measure the energy expenditure. We want to prove that just simulating a race for like 1.5, well, one, one mile race, right? The energy expenditure is like a very harsh, like uh, soccer games or rugby games or even like uh, a boxing, right? So we measured his energy expenditures used it over this. And after like, like one and a half minutes, we capture all the data, right? So this for like a one mile race is like a game of boxing, the energy expenditure that he used, right? So this is number one. So this one, we are trying to look at his posture. As I mentioned, right? Well, this is all talking about winning and losing. If you have a better posture, better stability, better aerodynamics, then it will be advantageous for you in the performance, right? So you can see that this jockey is like almost horizontal, parallel to the ground level, right? So this will significantly improve the aerodynamic and we also test the motion that he moves up and down and back and forth. And it's very, very stable, right? And then we also test the muscle strength, which this jockey, even he himself, don't know when and how he recruit the muscle. Indeed, we follow that, right, for this different kinds of muscle from the shoulder to the legs, right? From the starting gate, turning points, to the finishing line, he has been recruiting different kinds of muscle and different magnitudes, which he himself didn't, even didn't know. And then we are explaining to him. You can see the good muscle stopped working. So you didn't use it during the final stage. The final stage, he didn't use the muscle at the bottom. He used a lot of the hamstring and the quadriceps. A lot from here. This is near the finishing line that he used a lot of the muscles over there uh, at the hamstring and gluteus, right? I didn't know that, that, was, uh, that was happening. I mean, yeah. I never thought that I, on the full steep, uh, speed of the horse, mm. pushing the horse hard, I wouldn't use it as much okay. as uh, the, of that part of my body. Mm. But uh, yeah, I'm very surprised. I was very surprised. So those are the summaries of the findings. As I mentioned, we measure the energy expenditure, which is very much like a, like a boxing games. And then we measure all his motions and the muscle that have been recruited, right? Now, 
we, are, we take this, our jockey as a elite effort. I'm comparing him to the Hong Kong footballers of the year at that time to compare the basic facet in different aspects. So this is another one minute, right? Videos, right? He is the team captain of the Hong Kong football team and he's short, very much like Marrera, right? So it's like an equivalent, you know, uh, height and uh, body composition. So this is like a competition between a jockey and professional football players, right? Test number one is to test the arm muscle. You can, you can guess, right? For football players, probably this is not very good. So for jockey, they use a lot of this upper bodies, right? So... So these football players only can finish about 8 and Moreira can easily finish over 10, right? This is not a surprise to me, right? So the second one is like a... Test number two is testing the core muscle strength. The core muscle strength. Well, as I mentioned, the jockey needs to hold this martini grass posture for quite more than one minute, right? So we suppose that his core muscle is very good when compared with this Hong Kong footballers of the year, right? Yeah, I do pull the horses back and push them forward every day of my life. So I'm quite confident that I will be above of the average. Three, two, one, go! So, again, it's the wind with a narrow gap, right? So, the jockey is again, right? So, lastly, we want to test the lower limb muscle power. You may think that, well, for jockey, for football player, they are conscious of the lower limb muscle power must be very strong. Let's look at the results, right? So this is all those scientific way to test the different kinds of muscle power and this is testing the lower limb muscle power which includes the quadricep and the hamstrings. Right? Before the test, he is very confident that he can beat the jockey. We are measuring the, the distance that he raised I'm above sure the platform. I'm sure he will be able to jump any higher than a soccer player. Even he but himself thinks that he I'm will very, not be as good as the football players, the right? It's the same. It's the same. So you can see who won, right? So indeed, our jockeys win over there, right? So this is now the summary of this competitions, right? You can this this what we call test battery triangle, right? Where our jockey cover a larger surface area, while our Hong Kong footballers of the year cover a smaller surface area. That means in these competitions our jockey won't, right? So I don't want to linger on too long, right, for this, but I just want to let you know that well, sports science is very can be applied to improve the performance for our jockeys, right? This is also very useful as a monitoring and assessment as well, right? Finally, I want to bring you for a little bit about one very important issues regarding the weight control and how we look at this from a sports medicine aspect, right? So, this is what we captured um, in the field of our jockeys in Hong Kong. I love the occasional uh, chocolate bar or, you know, something like that. Barbecue. <laughs> I love that, but uh, we can't eat that much because that gets you very fat and it's hard to get rid of. We ask them how they control the weight. How they control the weight. So they tell you that, well, they, they, they will control their diet and all this, right? And, and similarly, Barrera is talking about how he controls the weight, right? more vegetables, a little bit of rice because I can't live without rice. This is what they tell you. But is this the reality? Like, uh, well, we, we'll, we'll discuss on that, right? More vegetables. So this is a paper published that, and a, a study published in Hong Kong, studying on uh, jockeys regarding some of the parameters that we want to measure, including First of all, their nutritional status, and secondly, the bone quality, and finally, their hydrational status. Well, this 
Studies show that first of all, I just want to summarize that while our Hong Kong jockey, very much like for a few other studies all around the world for the jockeys, uh, we have a little bit of osteopenia. Osteopenia means that our bone quality is not very good around the heel region. It's not yet reaching osteoporosis that you need treatment, but means that it's very different from the other kinds of sports. For football, rugby, and all this, they very, very seldom they will have this osteopenia at the age of 20 or 30 something, right? So this is one issue. And secondly, that while well, the energy and protein intake was significantly lower on the race day, you can imagine that very likely, right? It's not a surprise for us. And also, they have inadequacy of our micronutrient. What's the micronutrient which is important? Essentially, we are talking about vitamin D and calcium. Now, they have uh, less nutrition, they have uh, vitamin D deficiency and less calcium. That's why they have osteopenia. It means the bone quality is not good. So the problem was not, it's not just because of the nutrient is not okay. Because if you have a malnutrition or relatively like uh, 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 the nutritional status is not that good, and also you have and also, you are very often hypohydration. That means that they have to restrict their fluid intake very often, right? And this will lead to a lot of problems from these studies. This two studies is showing about the psychological effect on the jockeys in weight reduction. And it's very often they found that they have a depressive mood because of that, right? So lots of jockey, essentially, they are not just on using diet control, but more on the sauna and food restrictions for weight reduction. This is the reality, right? So the consensus from this study is that our jockey has relatively suboptimal bone health, and also they have suboptimal nutrition from energy, protein, and micronutrients, and suboptimal hydration status. And the problem of all this is that they can have weight loss to fulfill the criteria of the race, but in return, they have a compromised nutrition, bone density, dehydration, and that will prone them for injury. If you fall, you may get easier get fractures. And also, you have poor recovery between the races, like Wednesday and then Sunday. Between like these three days, you may have a less good recovery. And most importantly, some studies also show that it will affect the mood and causing some significant psychological depressions. So ladies and gentlemen, I just want to summarize my talk over the past 30 minutes in the following. First of all, I think there is still a lack of very good scientific research on the sports medicine and science applications for jockeys to protecting their health at the moment. And the application of all this knowledge for the best benefit of the health of the jockey still has lots of rooms to be improved. As I mentioned, all those are those initiations between my team and, um, and the jockey club's uh, colleagues, right? But it's not like publishing data and all this, but we believe that there are lots of rooms to apply and improve. So I think that, first of all, we, still, we probably need some consistent documentation and analysis of this injury and health problems of the jockey so much so that they can provide a platform to facilitate further injury prevention program and ultimately make the best benefit for the sports safer of the jockey. So once again, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. This is my research team and in this, for this preparation of this talk, uh, they have helped me to prepare all this like video testing and all this. I have to thank them. And once again, thank you Hong Kong Jockey Cup, uh, Amy and all the board members, as well as the uh, Asian Racing Conference to, for inviting me to come over here. Thank you very much. Great, Professor. Thank you very much indeed. If you want to have a seat, because you're going to be joining our panel after the next two presentations, here, right? which are about vocational training. And we're going to get the perspective from the Hong Kong Jockey Club and uh, from the chief executive of the British Riding School. Amy, if you want to come up to the stage. Amy Chan is the manager of the Racing Development Board, and she's also headmistress of the Hong Kong Jockey Club's Apprentice Jockeys School. Uh, the title's not there yet, so I'll say it. It's the Hong Kong Jockey Club's vocational training program you're going to tell yep, us about. That's right. Yeah, thank uh, you very Can much. we also eventually get some seats on for Amy and Grant, please? Yep. Do you want to do that now? No, not now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Go ahead, Amy. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Young, actually. Um, Thanks, uh, my boss, because uh, they're giving me a very good opportunity to be here. I was here in Seoul um, in 1988 Olympics. So it's uh, 30 years from now. So um, it is a very, very good time that for me to come over again. But now I'm presenting something on race, racing industry. Uh, 
Okay. So today um, I will talk about you know some contents you know to cover this you know uh, because of time I think uh, I will speed it up. Um, for those who do not know about much about Hong Kong drug law, I'll give you a very brief overview. Um, the club four principal areas of operation including racing, betting and entertainment, membership and charities. Um, we can see the club is the uh, the uh, charitable donations you know to the uh, charity uh, to the Hong Kong um, with 7.6 billion about 1 billion US dollars uh, to charity trust and the club is the largest single tax player in Hong Kong uh, we donated like US around 3 billion Hong Kong dollars uh, 3 billion US dollars and around 23 billion um, Hong Kong dollars I would like to bring you this because you know for the um, past 10 years you can see the turnover for the Hong Kong Child Club actually despite of the global economic downturn for the past years the club has a steady growth in turnover since 2007-2008 raising season well as my boss um, Winfred said this morning actually the club has adopted uh, the rigorous focus on customer satisfaction. That is why the steady growth is due to the strategy initiated at that time is about revitalized racing. And we build up the Hong Kong racing culture of excellence. So we have the initiatives such as the um, Happy Valley, Happy Wednesday campaign helps to attract a new generation of race goers to the sports, making the race course a popular place for young professionals and so to chill out after work and enjoy unique social experience, blending thrilling sports and wide variety of entertainment. But we also, you know, the club decided to revitalize racing and want racing in Hong Kong to become world-class and decided to invest in producing local talents to become world-class jockeys. So in 2005, the club established the Racing Demand Board which sets the policy and provides training for all racing industry personnel. So the board endeavors to train talented athletes with good conduct to become successful jockeys. Well, in Chinese saying, we said, what does it mean? It takes 10 years to grow a tree, but 100 years to nurture a person. It really take, in our good education program, three take a long time to develop. The apprenticeship school was established in 1972 with the uh, training model being based upon that which existed in many major overseas racing jurisdictions, particularly in the UK. Um, we put apprentices, you know, when they reach a certain level, we allocated to a selected trainer who would be required to mentor the apprentice and provide riding opportunities in track work, barrier trials, and ultimately in racing. So you can see trainer Tony Cruz and also Ricky Yu with, from the first apprentice jockey's school cohort. But today's training is a bit different. Uh, we need to use a good education system and it takes really good long time to develop a person. You can see a lot of uh, apprentices, when they first started, this cohort is started from a 2009, Jackie Wong, Dylan Mo, and Kei Chong was at that time. So the change of Ren Shockey's system, we tried to you know, have the training based in China to start the foundation racing trainees program training. And then we have the media training at R&D, another venue in China. And then before they come back to Sha Tin for the advanced training for the racing trainees. And then we send them to overseas for three months training as a potential work riders, but for AJs, maybe take two years. So, since the development of the Racing Demand Board, the, that means uh, the club committed to developing new generation of local talent for the entire industry, be it nurturing a progression of highly skilled local jockeys who could compete equally with overseas jockeys, providing com competent and dedicated track work riders 
the training of other members of the racing workforce, such as the civil assistants. And so we put all the training under one roof, and we developed the uh, Cert 2 in racing, Cert 3, Cert 4, and all the, uh, all the personnel working for the racing industry she attained or obtained certain kind of levels of um, uh, qualifications. We also have ferry course, and also we have the uh, cadet Siberian stewards course as well. I also introduced the dual education system into AJS training. Um, this is very um, successful in, in Germany. And that means integrating school-based learning with work-based practice. The idea is to impart not just knowledge about riding. A good education connects our trainees to, to the real world by supporting their personal growth and preparing them for different job roles within our Hong Kong Jockey Club. Since RDB adopted the dual education system, so we think that all around the education is very, very important. So the trainees will receive including riding, stable management, physical training, financial management, sports science, sports medicine, English, nutrition science, and also music appreciation for the training. But the racing staff will have a lot of different types of training. And over 900 racing staff for the past 10 years have already received some kind of you know, training. And we adopt the, uh, our all program are accredited by the uh, Hong Kong Council for Accreditation of Academic and Vocational Qualifications. And you can see we match with the uh, 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 academic, like in Hong Kong, qualification is also very, very important. So you can see all the racing staff, you know, to have to prov provide the, all the qualification so that they can work in overseas and also, you know, when they move to China. We also have a very um, unique career path, you know, for the racing trainees when they come over. Actually, they have different career path, you know, to follow. Uh, when a racing trainees if they not become a jockey, they can be, you know, racing management trainee or training a stable assistant. So uh, we have all sort of job types, you know, for them to follow. Um, the club also, you know, appointed Mr. Felix Cusi, the legendary jockey, to join the Apprentice Jockey School as chief riding instructor in 2017, last year, was the first step in our development of the program. Po for potential apprentice jockeys and work riders, we introduce a training structure under which all new racing trainees undergo stringent assessment criteria. As Professor Young said, you know, this is very important because you know, the uh, physical training and also the knowledge that they're going to acquire is so important. So we have the um, fitness test, stable orientation, and in-depth face-to-face interviews. In Hong Kong, most of our, our um, um, youngsters will not have the touch of a horse, you know, when they are very young. So we started at the age of 15 to come over and we provided a very sophisticated racing training program to train them. But the training is not just focused on riding. We care about individual growth and development. The intense live-in program enables the school to offer comprehensive all-round education to all our tra racing trainees including the certificate just now we see, up to qualification level three. And also, um, we po position all the uh, racing trainees as elite athletes. And hence, strength and conditioning training to build muscle strength, sports dietitian to put a diet plan together to ensure they have the right nutrition and being able to maintain the weight limit. We don't want them to go to sauna every day, you know, to put off their weight, um, and also we discipline apprentices' sleeping habit and discipline the use of the mobile gadgets and mobile phones. So we respect them and ask and care of them is the most important thing in dealing with young people nowadays. 
So learn about, we teach them to learn about the value of life as well. When they graduate, they become respectful young men and women, and when they, and we really very, feel very pleased. And overseas training is one of the key elements in, the, um, in our training. The purpose of sending apprentices for overseas training is to leverage on the well-established training systems and facilities overseas, and to develop apprentices to a higher standard prior to being licensed to rise in Hong Kong. This has proven to be a highly effective method of improving the overall standard of apprentice jockeys by allowing them to gain race riding experience at different tiers of racing and without the stream pressure and scrutiny which would exist in the apprentices where to begin their riding career in Hong Kong. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Johan Papser here because they were sent into uh, South Australia at the moment. Um, of course, Tasmania and also South Africa, we have, we've done, um, we send the, uh, and also New Zealand. We send some of our apprentices and also our work riders to be trained over there as well. We have put up a great career paths so that they can put up good plans for the future. And these are the, uh, our apprentices now become the uh, freelance jockeys and they're doing really good. And we have, we are very proud to have these young men's dreams come true. And it's said in our motto, to strive is to shine. And uh, before I came, actually, my apprentices and tra racing trainees composed a, a video that wants to show you guys about their life at the apprentice jockey school. And the song is also composed and lyrics composed by them. It's talking about the dreams. This is in Cantonese, but I hope you understand the feel. And they're searching for a dream, and this, most of the young people are doing this. And this piece, purple is shirt is the uh, Minglam work riders for. So, hope you like it. Before I move on, um, so we are very committed to nurturing better young persons for the racing industry uh, and for Hong Kong community at large. But what next? Beyond our boundaries, right? So this is Chongfa Training Center. Over the last four decades, Hong Kong's horses have been stabled and trained at Shatin Racecourse. To supplement these facilities for nearly 20 years, the Hong Kong Jai Club sought additional land in Hong Kong, but eventually it settled on the site where it had designed and built the equestrian venue for the Guangzhou 2010 Olympic uh, Asian Games. You can see the uh, RDB training stables. So we have 60 stores and an observation gallery for visitors. It shows that um, the club is very committed in training and education of staff in mainland China. The CDC will have four tracks, a turf uphill gallop, one turf track, two all weather turf tracks and which is the first of its kind in the Chinese mainland of Hong Kong. 
And the staffing, we relied on our due site model. And this is the obstacles and challenges for Hong Kong. Uh, the club has called on a number of its most experienced Hong Kong-based managers to make the move to Chongfa, as well as recruiting well-qualified few leaders from abroad. As CDC becomes another extension of the club's racing operations model. So we need to make sure that we have a good overlay of overseas experience in Hong Kong experience managing the local workforce, so owners and trainers can feel comfortable that the CDC workforce is the right hands. So when the CDC opens in August 2018, a workforce of over 400 will be in place. Of those, 150 will work in stable operations, including almost 40 work riders, nine traveling rooms, and more than 100 stable assistants. So the challenge will be to find the right people in China. So recruitment started over two years ago. It has been a long process. And for work riders, we started Chinese mainland intake for those work riders without experience. Out of over 1,500 applicants, we have a short list of around 500 based on a paper screening. From there, they underwent a fitness test, and then they went through a stable orientation assessment program. Eventually, they were narrowed down to 25, and they have progressed through training they have been deployed to trainers in Hong Kong. And feedback from those trainers have been incredibly positive. The work rider training program is a multi-step process, which ensure that when they begin to work with the Hong Kong host population in Chongfa, they arrive with sufficient experience. Another challenge, the recruitment of stable assistance. The recruitment of stable assistance um, actually went smoothly with over around 1,538 applications um, for 100 vacancies. And we have started training for the first three batches now, uh, each batch of 25, and approximately um, they are under training in two venues in China. So under the same process, we have interview, fitness test, stable orientation, at at different places in, in, in China. And they are under the uh, training, the same program with the Hong Kong uh, counterparts. So we also need to upgrade our trainer. So we have the train the trainers program. The inclusivity, we have the uh, South African uh, trainers, we have the uh, mainland trainers, and we have the Hong Kong local trainers. Um, to train the, uh, the apprentice. So the challenge is the, uh, in the multi-generation workforce nowadays, there is a bigger challenge where the older generations feels the younger generations emphasis too much on work-life balance and ignores the essence of hardworking and a learning attitude. While new generation feels there are few opportunities and less appreciation of their performances. In the multicultural workplace nowadays, we need to explore best practices of working harmoniously together with better communications and understanding and appreciation among each other in the workplace, dialogues to understand more and thoughts and decides of new generation and examine ways to better recruit, retain and develop our younger generation we will make. Um, lately, we have the, like the 4,000 candidates, uh, targeted candidates, that which they are the uh, school children uh, at the age of 15, you know, to know more about our program. So we just want to make sure the two, the profession understand more of what the younger generation expects and things whereas our new generation can learn more from the experienced seniors to cultivate a more harmonious and effective work environment, ensuring the fruits of development and help to sustain growth for the club. Last but not least, I would like to show you again the milestone that we have gone through for the past 12 years 
And now we go beyond our boundaries and building organizational capabilities to accelerate performance and sustain competitive advantage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. If you'd like to have a seat, yep. uh, Grant, your turn. Grant Harris is here to give us uh, the British perspective, I believe, uh, of what Amy's just been talking about. Britain's rider training program comes from the chief executive of the British Racing School. No. Sorry. Thank you, Adnan. Uh, good evening. Uh, yet another Brit, yet another pale, male, stale white guy, I'm afraid. Um, I'll get this over with as quick as possible. I know we're running late. Um, however, just going back on some of the themes we've already spoken about today, um, many of the things that we do are similar to what Amy does in Hong Kong, but you should all be aware, obviously, of the changing demographics and the way people are changing. And indeed, recently at our racing school, we've had to do, deal with the first uh, transition of gender during a race, during one of our courses, when a young lady transitioned into a young man at the time of training. So there are lots and lots of challenges out there, not just teaching people to ride, but it's all to do about life skills and supporting people through their journey, as Amy has alluded to. Susanna earlier mentioned that, um, that we have some challenges in the UK. Um, but firstly, I'd like to thank everybody for staying on. It's a bit late in the afternoon now uh, and giving me this opportunity to present and discuss hopefully vocational training in the horse racing industry and give a brief uh, insight into the way it's delivered in the UK. I feel slightly like the poor relation uh, after Amy's presentation. Uh, there are two racing schools in the UK. Both are independent charities. We have to bid for government and industry funding. One is in the north of England in Doncaster. It's called the Northern Racing College. Uh, and as Adam said, I'm the CEO of the British Racing School. Um, this is a new market in the UK, uh, which is often referred to as the headquarters of racing. Firstly, there's one large statement to make. And I sat through this morning and although I think uh, us talking about products and brands is very important, without single doubt, people are an industry's biggest asset. In the UK, as in many other racing nations, there is a skill shortage. Uh, as Susanna said earlier, we have economic full employment. And last year, for the first time in many, many years, more racing grooms left the racing industry than joined it. I'm passionate about training young people to work in horse racing. But young people have choices and horse racing needs to be an attractive option. Without them to exercise horses, there is no horse racing. It's not a job, it's a vocation. We talked about that earlier again. It's a highly skilled and sometimes dangerous job with long unsocial working hours and practices. And there are three main themes which need to coexist in the workplace at the coalface where people are exercising racehorses in the morning and that is recruit, train and retain. So these are some of the things I'm going to talk about uh, and go through very quickly, otherwise we're all going to be here very late. Those are the areas I'm going to touch on. So comprehensive training. Um, we at the British Racing School and at the Northern Racing College aim to deliver a comprehensive suite of training and educational programmes to those wishing to enter the horse racing industry. For those wishing to ride, the programmes start as school children. So we start earlier than Amy would, possibly in Hong Kong. And then there is CPD for those to continue right through the rest of their careers. Interesting just to touch on gender again, and we've been through diversity earlier in the programme. We're now looking at an intake around 70% female and 30% male. And the UK industry is going to need to face up to that fact quite quickly. The trend is only going one way. 
There's also a range of programs for those who wish to industry in non-riding positions. And we've recently introduced a ground-based yard staff course for those that want to work in stables but don't want to ride. And then we do all the other courses for secretaries, administrators, management, etc., etc. We also have to focus on training from, from people from abroad. Uh, and this year we'll welcome uh, apprentice jockeys, grooms, trainers and managers from all parts of the world. This spring, we've just had two of the best young South African apprentices at school. We currently have an Australian jockey who's trying to transition out of being a jockey because he's six foot four and become a racehorse trainer. And we've just recently completed the Massar, Godolphin Massar program for nine Emiratis. So facilities. We're very lucky, although, again, as I said, looking at what Amy has, we're slightly feeling like the poor relation. The British Racing School is built on a 130-acre site in Newmarket. It was built in 1984, and as I say, it's a charity which is funded by a combination of industry, government, and self-finance. We're lucky in that we have all the major training assets, such as indoor schools, menages, horse walkers, lunge rings, all-weather gallops, grass gallops, turnout paddocks, starting stalls, equisizers, gyms, etc. We have 94 stables, uh, 80 horses on loan. They're all retired race horses given us to us by their owners until then can't do the job any longer. We have 86 bed spaces, seven riding instructors, a senior jockey coach, a fitness instructor, and something I'm particularly proud of, we've just appointed our first school nurse. Training in England is not mandatory. Both schools care passionately about training the highly skilled workforce that we need. And there are many entry level programs catering for young people with that passion to work with thoroughbreds. For us, it can start with pony racing. And we deliver this training to children regardless of their standard of riding. Children who don't have access to their own ponies. The aim is to get them to compete on a weekly basis around the country in pony races. We have four racing ponies at the racing school and we run a pony racing academy where children without access to their own ponies can come to the racing school on 12 weekends with the hope of participating in a pony race. Pony racing in the UK, it's taken some time to develop, but now we're getting going. The price of ponies, especially a fast racing pony, is going through the roof. So we're trying to trying to bring in young people through a variety of methods. They can come from eight up to the ages of 16 when pony racing starts. Sorry, you can pony race from the age, years of nine up to 16 when it stops, sorry. It's a good grounding for children. It gives them lots of confidence. They meet friends, same interests. They have continuity with the other mates that they make going through the training days. And any issues, we can, we can address any issues they have knowing that they're in a safe environment. We also run three pony racing camps throughout the year where the children come and stay with their own pony for a week or again use ours. And indeed, we had two American lads come over last year for the advanced racing pony camp. That's for 15, 16 year olds on the, uh, just about to finish on the pony racing circuit before they go on and start their professional riding careers. Lots of our professional jockeys have now come through this route. Uh, particularly people like Tom Marquand, Harry Cobden, George Wood, who are just about to make a name for themselves as senior jockeys. We also, we also run a schools programme. Um, this is for those that are still in full-time education in their academic years 10 and 11, so 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds. And they attend the British Racing School one day a week in turn time to learn about all aspects of racing how to ride, and how we can confidently then signpost them into employment. Some have already ridden, some have absolutely no experience whatsoever. We use evidence from both their theoretical and practical lessons and upload them onto an e-portfolio so of, of our own software, which goes towards their qualifications. Again, like Amy, we have qualifications that we want the young people to get to once they complete their in the workplace. Students also given an insight into the industry, trips and work experience to trainers' yards and to the race course. This program, again, has to be sponsored and we're lucky that we've just done a deal with a, an old livery company in London who is, um, who is now working with us on this program. Again, 
very successful jockeys like Luke Morris and now Adam Brasheka, who's been doing great things in the States, went through this program. Both Pony Racing and the schools program really are us talent spotting future potential. We're trying to make it fun and safe as we prepare them and the, prepare them with the groundwork that is necessary for the transition into the workplace. Foundation courses. This really is the bread and butter of the racing school and indeed the NRC in Doncaster. This is training for young people, 16 to 18 year olds just exiting at school who want to work for racehorse trainers in either a riding or a non-riding capacity. Recruitment is national um, and currently includes, we may take EU students at the moment, but as again, Susanna touched on, Brexit may change that because of the free movement of people. It's open to all, whether they've ridden or never even put a head collar on before. Um, we run four, nine and 14 week courses, depending on previous experience. The four weekers would have ridden most of their lives. The 14 weekers may never, ever, as I say, put a head collar on, never mucked out, never seen a horse. It's their first time away from home. It's a residential course. It's a rigorous interview and selection process, very like Amy's. Fitness and aptitude are everything. And the aim is to replicate the daily routine in a training yard with students waking up at half past five to attend their practical riding and theory lessons. There are visits to race courses, to racing yards and work experience in a yard. Students are also taught functional skills. For those not aware what that means, that means English and maths qualifications that they fail to get at school. So a school will have them for 14, 14 years, we have them for 14 weeks and we have to try and get them an English and maths exam. Again, all the evidence is loaded onto our own software of e-portfolios and goes towards their qualification. Here, uniquely, with, in our sport compared to any other sport, we guarantee these guys a job with a racehorse trainer. Last year, we put 175 graduates into training with a racehorse trainer. And can we just now play the video, please? Just a bit of light relief. I'm from Wrighton uh, in Oldham, Manchester. I left school with average grades, very average. I weren't the most intelligent. I was more interested in my sport. From the youngest age I can remember, I wanted to be a footballer. I wanted to play for United. I started doing part-time work at a local pub. I was working my way up in the kitchen and I ended up actually being sous chef there when I was about 17. I was watching racing on the TV. I mean, I'd always liked watching racing. Um, I was just pouring myself a drink on the bar and I was watching the racing. The owner actually said, oh Gavin, you're the right size for a jockey, why don't you do that? And I, I just shrugged my shoulders and said, well, if I knew how to get into it, I would. And they said, well, why don't you speak to Emma? She's got a horse. So she said, well, next step is going to the British Racing School uh, down in Newmarket. She said, you go there, apply, and then you'll be put on a yard and then you get put forward for your license, get your license and you race. So obviously it was all so simple in my head that just become a jockey. Anyway, I went down to the racing school and 14 weeks I spent there and absolutely loved it. It was the, it was a really hot summer, I remember. I remember sitting on the horses and just thinking like, where's my seatbelt and all this. I don't know how they had so much patience with me because the first couple of days I could not trot. I had to hold the saddle and I just could not do it. But I wanted to learn. I slowly got there, I slowly started to learn. Um, and started getting better and better and just listening to what um, the teachers had to say. And I remember them saying that two of you will be chosen to be a head lad and head lass. Everyone had pretty much ridden at some point in their life. Apart from me, I was the only one that hadn't, but I was determined to try and stick at that and achieve that. And I, I was made head lad at the racing school. I finished at the racing school. There's a great opportunity at a yard um, at Sir Mark Prescott's. I remember going meeting some art for the first time. I was very, very nervous. I was. I remember going in the office and I did didn't dare move. It, it's perfect, really, because um, he'll give you that advice and he'll he'll cred, he'll praise you whenever you do something right. He will praise you, um, but he'll keep you very grounded and won't let it get to your head. 
they put me on the right horses to learn that I could, was capable with and they slowly introduce you to uh, better horses and more tri tricky horses. It was actually on my birthday that Will said to me, okay, you're gonna be put into your license, which then was the next step. And then the next step was to get my first ride, which I was very lucky two weeks after getting my license, I got my first ride, which was a massive shock. The amount of opportunities in racing is is massive. I thought just coming into it, I only saw jockeys. Like that's all I saw. I saw absolutely nothing else before I came into it. And now it's opened my eyes to a whole different world. There's definitely something for everyone because, like I say, even if you're not the most sportiest, even if you don't like riding them, you can look after them. You've got to be a hundred percent committed. Um, there's no point in going at it half-hearted. I definitely recommend anyone just giving it a go. You've got to give it a go once in your life. You've got to work hard and the, the, you'll get the rewards. Um, as I was saying, so our core business is really making stable staff, stable grooms. Occasionally one is good enough and has the talent to make it. So those three programs we've talked about, the pony racing, the schools program and the foundation courses really are our entry level programs. Whereas I said, we teach far more than just learning how to ride a thoroughbred. It's all the skills to equip young people to transition into independent living with a range of qualifications and life skills. But some of them do go on to take out their license. And that's what I want to talk about in a minute. And we were very lucky with Gavin there, who was an exceptional young man. As he said, he was a sous chef in a pub 18 months ago. He's now working with some Art Prescott. He got his license. He's had two rides and he's actually ridden his first winner, which is fantastic. Most of these guys, though, are going to need a second career. It's only a very, full, a very few, a very small percentage which will make it as a jockey. And so we have to manage expectations and manage what they think they're going to do when they leave racing. That's another story. So license courses, as I said, Gavin's been really lucky and actually made it and had a winner. Um, so apprentice or conditional licenses, because we do national hunt racing in the UK, and that's a different skill, um, allows riders between the ages of 16 and 26 years old to take out a license to ride against professionals, as I'm sure you know. We have a pre-license pre assessment course, which is held six days, six weeks prior to the two-week license course. It's a one-day course where candidates are interviewed by our senior jockey coach, assessed on their fitness, their riding ability. It's then up to us to recommend whether or not that candidate is suitable to have a place on the two-week license course. The British Horse Racing Authority makes that ultimate decision on that recommendation. We're then responsible for delivering a whole set of criteria and a curriculum on that two weeks, much again as Amy has outlined. Nine main headings, technical, tactical, physical, nutrition, mental, psychological, lifestyle, career, finance, communication and media, and health and safety and safeguarding. Course is split between a junior, a jo the senior jockey coach delivering sessions and outside speakers coming in to present to jockeys. After that, two weeks, they're then assessed. Undergo a final riding assessment, simulator assessment, fitness assessment, completed course, and a test about the curriculum. And then they get their report. Then hopefully they get their license. Again, that's down to the British Horse Racing Authority. Once they do get their license, they're automatically enrolled onto the jockey coaching program. The British Horse Racing Authority introduced this about six or seven years ago. Um, it's administered by the British Racing School on behalf of the BHA and the scheme is, in in, is, in, is designed to improve the skills of young jockeys and to develop all-round sportsmen and women. Currently, there are about 170 licensed apprentices and conditionals in the UK. 95% of these are enrolled on the programme. Once granted a licence, the jockey is allowed six hours coaching per month from one of the jockey coaches in the first three months and then this reduces down to four hours a month. All the jockey coaches have had previous successful professional riding careers themselves. The role includes one-to-one -one tuition, supervised course walks, post-race analysis. 
Jockeys are coached in all aspects of their careers, from technical support, motivation, confidence, fitness, communication skills, etc. They receive the coaching until they ride out their claim. Um, and it allows them, we then then have a three month uh, cooling down period where they still have access to the jockey coach. At present, we have 23 jockey coaches on the programme, and I think it was announced today that unfortunately the lead jockey coach in this programme, Philip Robinson, who many of you in this part of the world will know, who's an exceptional jockey in Hong Kong, has just left to become a racing manager to one of the Arab owners. Um, but there are still many other famous jockeys on the programme, including Kevin Darley, John Reed, Michael Hills and Michael Tebbit. Running alongside that is the Racing Excellence series. Um, these are races which have special conditions such as hands and hills, training race conditions, whether or not the jockeys can use a whip or not. Coaches attend these races, provide extra tuition in walking courses beforehand, tact tactics, fitness, etc. Points are awarded to the jockeys for winning as well as being placed as well as on professionalism and conduct, how they turn up to the race courses and how they interview if they have to go in front of the stewards, etc. Jockeys with the most points win the series, etc. And the series is recognised by racehorse trainers and owners, an important element of a young jockey's racing career. Regional training. As I said, we have our own full-time jockey coach, as well as seven riding instructors. Recently, we purchased this mobile training van with an equisizer in it and lots of other training aids. And this facility is available to be booked by trainers and visits major training centers and individual training establishments outside Newmarket on a weekly basis. The aim here is to provide continual professional development for those working in racing yards without the necessity for them to have to come to us, to have to come to Newmarket. British Racing School is currently evaluating the possibility of opening satellite premises in Lambourne in Berkshire, which is the second largest training centre in the UK. This will possibly include a schools, a skill, a schools programme and the CPD element. It would also help us in our recruitment reach. As I said, another very vital source of income for us is foreign training. We have a wealth of experience in delivering this for foreign students and turf authorities. We're involved in a number of scholarship programmes. As I said, we've got lots of young people coming to us and in fact, we're sending Jamie Gormley to Australia at the end of this year for three months to increase his profile out there and to hopefully to train him to be a better apprentice jockey when he comes back. We host overseas apprentice courses where lots of jurisdictions send us, send us their, overseas, their apprentices and they come and all join together. And we deliver training for grooms, jockeys, trainers and managers. Uh, and also bespoke programmes. In fact, we do a lot of work here with the KRA who have sent us um, grooms, jockeys, trainers and managers for about the last five years. We also do a lot of work with Godolphin. As I said, we've done the Massar, the new Massar programme and we've also do the Flying Start programme and with the South African Jockey Academy. It's not just, uh, it's not just about those that want to ride or work in stables. We also deliver for the industry all these other courses. These are incredibly important, obviously. Everybody deserves training. We are the main training provider for the industry in the UK. We have developed a whole raft of management programmes, which Jockey Club and the BHA are now sending their managers on. It's delivered through an independent training provider. As you can see, there are lots of other courses that we run. And just to finish, the next big step in the BRS's history and the effort to be a centre of excellence is a collaborative project with the Injured Jockeys Fund. In 2009, the IJF opened its first fitness and rehab centre, Oaksey House in Lambourne, and in 2015, it opened its second Jack Berry House in Moulton for the northern-based jockeys. A third, Peter O'Sullivan House, will open at the British Racing School in late 2019, early 2020. It will be a state-of-the-art fitness and rehab centre, fit for horse racing's participants and the equal of any in any other sport or in indeed anywhere else in the world. To conclude, thank you. It's been my privilege to speak to you today. I trust you found it informative. As was said, ARC is a marketplace for ideas to allow nations to formulate their strategies. Hopefully, meetings like this will allow us to innovate, collaborate and transform 
training and education of young people wanting to work in horse racing around the globe. As I said at the start, we are only as good as our people. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Grant, thank you very much. Okay, we've got 10 minutes, so let's be as targeted as possible. And actually, I might even ask you questions about things you haven't particularly Ooh. addressed because we can expand the discussion a bit. Yeah. Uh, Professor, I tell you what, you did actually mention this a little bit, but let's get a bit more detail because you said that there hasn't been enough done uh, in terms of both the injuries that jockeys suffer, but also this issue of the psychological effect of uh, having to go through rapid weight loss. Yeah. What, what is sports science doing in terms of trying to help jockeys deal with that issue? Well, uh, I would say that uh, currently, um, let me take the examples of the application of the orders in the other kinds of sports because uh, horse racing is a, a sports, right? So for this, uh, like for example, for a lot of weight um, uh, conscious sports like karate and all this, uh, taekwondo, judo, rowing, all this, right? Uh, I would say that like in Hong Kong, we, uh, we have been taking care of them in the Hong Kong Sports Institute, right? Uh, we are in a certain extent that well, they are all being coached and also monitors regarding the weight control. And then we, we claim that this is kind of like a scientific way with evidence base, which on the one hand, we, we help them to reach the target. But on the other hand, we make sure that it will not endanger their health, right? Right now, I would say that, like, for example, in apprentice schools, uh, under the school and, the, and, the, and on this guidance, right, they're doing quite well. But some experienced jockeys, right, well, established jockeys, they may have their own way that they learn from their own experience or their mentors to try to control the weight and all this, right? That may work in terms of weight control. But on the other hand, they may not be aware that, well, that may endanger their health. For example, dehydration is very common. So some of our jockeys, they get like the, the kidney stones and all this from this, right? They may get a heat stroke or collapse uh, after the race or during the race and all this. So that may be related with all this like a relatively non-scientific way of weight control and reduction. And we, we, on the one hand, we want them to perform well, but on the other hand, we want them to, to keep their welfare, or especially on the healthy side, right? Okay, you know, Grant and Amy, this very much is a question for you. I, yesterday, at the opening dinner, met two Sri Lankan gentlemen who had 100 horses. They were in one particular part of Sri Lanka, a very small organization wanting to expand racing in their country. They said at the moment they only get their horses from India. They're not here, they've gone home now. But if you were to talk to them, because in the UK, you've got money. At the Hong Kong Jockey Club, you've got money. The pictures that you showed us of your training facilities must be some of the very best in the world. But if you haven't got that kind of money, what are the two or three things that an organization could do to have vocational training, but without the facilities that you have? What are the two or three most important things in terms of your vocational training that you would pass on to other organizations? Amy? I think it's set a, a good model you know, for training. It's, it's very, very important. Uh, we start off with, a, with only 12 horses, actually, the retired horses. And, um, and we started with all the trainees without really horse experience. So we, we just want them to you know, have, a, have the experience for the foundation training first. So they start off with the uh, we learn to ride and then gradually move on. Give them a kind of you know, a, a little success in, in a world. And then, you know, uh, we make full use of the overseas, you know, training, you know. And actually, the uh, budget for that is, is not, is not a, that big because, you know, this, it's a win-win situation. We send to Australia and Australia needs, you know, manpower as well. So, so we, we, we talk about that and then, you know, we, we work out, you know, the system for that. Grant? Like Amy, our schools program and our pony racing programs are small. Small beer, 12 people on each year. Um, I think they're successful because we have a very good instructor, a lady who's passionate about it. She makes it fun. It's a day away from school, which they love generally. <laughs> the, uh, the pony racing guys come in at the weekends, but they're, they're a bit more fanatic. But it's about infusing young people. Keep them safe, make it fun. Yes, and I think you mentioned, Grant, that not everybody can be an elite jockey. So no. even if you like horses and have that ultimate aim a bit like the chap in the video who wanted to be a footballer a tiny yeah. percent make it but it's important that what both of you do is provide training for 
every kind of relationship that you can have with a horse. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the horsemanship and also the sportsmanship. Yeah. Uh, I think the uh, the most important thing is is that you know every youngsters have a dream. You know that type of dreams. You know, you know, it's different tiers, different layers. You know, when they have a little success, they will move on. You know, and then academic only is is not very very good. It, I think globally now, vocation education I think is the key to help the youngsters to find out something you know that they really like. Um, not just staying at home, you know, and doing something that they don't like. Horses or animals, you know, most of the uh, the younger generation loves it. You know, when they when they don't speak, but they they talk to the horse. You know, I, I think that this is a really good you know uh, way of you know uh, bringing up our youngsters in the future. And Grant, you were saying you at the BRS work with uh, younger ages than the Hong Kong Jockey Club does. But interesting, you mentioned another societal issue is urbanization, people moving to cities yeah. and therefore not spending time when they're younger working with horses. So how does that reflect when people come to you? Do you well, what evidence do you see of what you need to do to them to help them understand the horse better than they might have done if they'd lived in the countryside and yeah. known horses? I think you're right. I, I haven't got the statistics to the hand, but more and more people are living in cities in the UK. Less, fewer people, young people are having exposure to horses when they come. Converse, most of the girls that we would see will have ridden something. The boys split into two distinct camps. They're either born to it or they've never put a bridle on in their lives and they're sports fans, like Gavin. Mm. Sometimes it's easier with a blank piece of paper. He has no, he had no faults. And being through, a, he, he had been through Manchester City's Football Academy. He was a sponge. Mm. He just wanted to learn. I mean, he, they're hen's teeth. <laughs> they're great. I mean, we've got all kinds of other societal issues with weight, obesity. There's a huge stack of problems coming down the track, I believe, for horse racing in Europe. It's not just us. France has a problem with these stable staff as well, as does Ireland. Young people are just not engaged with this sport. And I firmly believe that unless we can attract young people of talent, we are going to be in a serious problem quite soon. Amy, going back to that panel that we had about diversity mm. in racing, mm. how do you feel in Hong Kong or in other countries you've visited? Because being in the job you are, you must be invited to see other training schools around the world about women being engaged at the upper levels in terms of being jockeys. Mm. How do trainers feel about bringing women to work for them? What's your, your feeling about women in the sport? Um. In horse racing, it actually is, is like a very fair system. Men and women, you know, race together. So um, we, we brought up a, a apprentice jockey called Kei Chong, who, who she won the uh, People's Choice Award. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the worldwide, you know, voting. Uh, why? And, and the trainers and also the owners really love her. But, but Hong Kong situation is very scary because, you know, um, after 15 years, we can produce another one girl. You know, that means, you know, it's scarce. Um, and the people will think that, wow, that, that girl, you know, is really good, you know, they, they give her opportunities. But all over the world, I can see more and more girls and women, you know, take part in, in, in the dangerous sports. But we should treat them the same because, you know, every, every little thing, you know, uh, we, we encounter actually the courage and also the confidence. So how we brought them up is, is with uh, self-esteem and confidence and also you know, inclusivity and th they think it's fair. When they reach a certain level, they, they will move up you know, to another level. So uh, we, we bring this up you know, to all our friends and they really hunger for that. You know, so, so this is really good. That is good to hear. Okay, well, one minute, 20 seconds. We could leave it there, couldn't we? We've gone past five o'clock. And if you attended every session of the day, you get a badge. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Patrick, you. uh, young you. professor, yeah. Amy and Grant. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Grant. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick. Well done, yeah, yeah. So bright and early, can you turn this on again? Bright and early tomorrow, nine o'clock, we'll be starting. See you then. Thanks. That looks... Oh.